Hi, everybody. I'm Lauren Burchard, Director of Historical Programs at the U.S. Capitol Historical Society. Once again, we're delighted to welcome you to one of our online webinars. Uh, today, we'll feature David Girlman and speaking about uh, BBF, as he was calling him yesterday when we chatted. I will turn it over now to Jane Campbell, the President and CEO of the U.S. Capitol Historical Society. Uh, thank you so much, Lauren. It, it's always a Delight to know that you're at the helm of the technical situation here. Um, the Capital Historical Society moved to virtual programming not more than probably six weeks ago. Um, and we have had such a wonderful response from our members, guests, friends, and supporters of the society who are really so interested in the history of the Capitol and the role of the Capitol in really making sure that we have the symbol of our democracy strong and well understood. Today's scholar, David Gerleman, is an Abraham Lincoln scholar and a 19th century historian who's currently at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. He is an emeritus assistant editor of the papers of Abraham Lincoln and Gerleman helped lead the project's decade-long search effort at the National Archives and is the only scholar worldwide to have uncovered over 100 previously unknown autographed Lincoln documents. Dr. Gerleman received distinguished fellowships from so many places that we wouldn't be able to hear his presentation if we went through every single one of them. But let me just say, he is a well-known, well-respected scholar, currently a research fellow at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture and the National Sporting Library and Museum. His most recent publication, Attuned to the Past, The Civil War Legacies of the Parton Brothers of Sevier County, Tennessee, won the McClung Award for the best article in the Journal of East Tennessee History. His forthcoming article, Put the Crepe on Your Hat, the 1864 Burning of the Lincoln White House Stables, will be published in the White House History Quarterly. It is an honor for me to present to you Dr. Gerleman, who will tell us the story about Lincoln's major domo. And it is a fascinating story. Dr. Gerleman? Hello, Jane. Hello. Glad to have you with us. Thank you very much for having me. And I'd like to thank uh, all the members who have decided to tune in today. I'm most grateful. Uh, I'm going to talk a little today about Benjamin Brown French, uh, who for over 40 years was uh, a resident and an intimate, uh, not only of Washington, uh, but of Congress uh, and of Capitol Hill. Uh, he served not once but twice uh, as the commissioner of public buildings uh, which basically put him in charge of uh, all federal buildings within the district uh, that's the white house it's the capitol uh, in fact during the civil war he was quite surprised to learn that the old capitol prison was also uh, under his uh, jurisdiction uh, french um, for many years uh, was uh, an employee of uh, of Congress, of the House of Representatives, and hopefully again my, there we go, hope, uh, hopefully that worked properly. Um, most people don't know him or, or haven't heard of him, and that's uh, really uh, rather a shame. Um, just a, a brief biography of him, he's born in 1800 in Chester, New Hampshire. Uh, he grows up there, his father was a very prominent a merchant. Uh, he has, like many people in the 19th century, he has many different careers. Uh, he studies law, he becomes a law clerk, uh, he becomes a newspaper editor. Uh, for a brief stint, he's in the U.S. Army. Uh, he then uh, is in the New Hampshire militia. Uh, and uh, in fact, for the rest of his life, he'll often be referred to as Major French, uh, the title that he bore in uh, the militia. Uh, he will come to Washington uh, in December of 1833, and he will live uh, the rest of his life here in the nation's capital, although he will 
travel quite frequently back and forth, uh, not only to New England, but also uh, into the Midwest. Uh, he's really rather well traveled, uh, certainly for even the 19th century. And uh, what I'm going to do today basically is offer a number of vignettes uh, from uh, French's journal. He was, like many good middle class Victorians, a uh, infatigable uh, journalist, uh, that is, uh, writing in a diary or a daily journal. Uh, and fortunately, uh, he oftentimes will comment on what's happening on Capitol Hill, uh, what's going on in his family life. Uh, and, uh, you know, he doesn't just chronicle what the weather is, uh, etc. He's really a, a very good journalist. Uh, and all of these vignettes, by and large, will come from uh, witness uh, to the Young Republic, which was published in 1989, which uh, contained large excerpts uh, from his 11 volumes uh, of journals that he keeps from roughly 1828 until he dies in 1870s. Uh, and those journals, as well as the, um, a good chunk of the French family papers, uh, are at the Library of Congress. In fact, they're, they're rather unique as uh, historical documents go in that they basically rest on the exact same spot where they were created. Uh, that is, uh, the modern day Library of Congress sits on top uh, of the block where French lived uh, from uh, roughly 1838 until he dies in 1870. So in a way, those journals have come back home and uh, are part of a voluminous collection of papers the Library of Congress has um, French uh, is also, I will say, he's somewhat of a rebel in that uh, uh, politically his family tended to be Federalist. Uh, he then rebels and becomes a Jacksonian Democrat. Uh, he will try his hand, as I've said, at a number of different professions before he will move to Washington and spend uh, basically the entire rest of his life uh, here in Washington. Uh, he builds a house. Uh, on, at 37 East Capitol Street, which is, uh, as you'll see in one of the upcoming slides here, uh, literally across the street from the U.S. Capitol. Uh, it is uh, the briefest of walks uh, from French's home, uh, a picture of which you see there, uh, to the Capitol building. Uh, he builds a house there, the, the image of which is on, on the screen, uh, in the 1840s. In fact, uh, it was rather, I think, a quick construction job. Uh, they start digging the foundations in, uh, what is it, uh, May of 1842, and they're moving in in July of 1842. Uh, so they did, uh, whoever built the house did apparently a bang up job of, of getting it uh, ready. Uh, and apparently it was on a very large lot. Uh, he had a stable, he had a, a, a workshop. Uh, French also has problems with fire. His stable burns down, uh, his workhouse burns down at another uh, instance, uh, but the house uh, remains safe at least until uh, it's torn down in uh, 1895 to make room for the Library of Congress. Uh, you also see an image on your screen. David, can you tell us about his family? Um, oh, yes, certainly. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, he comes from a New Hampshire family. Uh, he is the eldest of 11 children. Uh, his father, and again, this isn't all that unusual for the 19th century. Uh, French is the only child uh, of his father's first marriage. His mother, unfortunately, dies uh, not long after he's born, uh, within a year or two. Uh, his father then remarries, uh, produces another four children, uh, and then, unfortunately, his second wife uh, dies young as well, and so he marries her sister. Uh, and then has another uh, four or five uh, children. So it's uh, the French family from just uh, his father alone was rather extensive. Um, there's a fairly large gap between French and his uh, youngest sim siblings, some of which uh, will live into uh, the 20th century. Uh, and French himself will be married twice. Uh, he will here again, he's somewhat of a rebel. He uh, marries his first wife secretly uh, in 1825 because apparently the family is disapproved uh, of the match uh, for whatever reason. Uh, and uh, 
Uh, his first wife, uh, rather sadly, dies in 1861 of breast cancer. Uh, and he records all of this uh, in his journal, uh, talking about her diagnosis, uh, her mastectomy that she has with anesthesia uh, in November of 1860, uh, and her death then in May of uh, 1861. Uh, he will then uh, become rather emotionally attached, uh, if I can digress for just a moment, to the uh, sister of his sister-in-law. Uh, French will marry uh, his youngest brother's uh, sister-in-law, uh, Mary Ellen Brady, uh, in 1862. Uh, she will be about um, uh, 25 years younger than he, uh, and they will then live uh, on Capitol Hill until he dies in 1870, and she will live on uh, until 1905. Uh, French will have two children by his first marriage, uh, two sons, uh, French, Francis French and Benjamin French Jr. Uh, and here again, those journals are wonderful because uh, French will detail uh, the difficulties of parenthood in that uh, the sons are seemingly polar opposites. Uh, uh, the eldest son is very dutiful, does all the right things, attends Exeter, Harvard, law school, uh, becomes a, a prominent banker, uh, along with uh, in Jay Cook's firm, uh, and the youngest son, Benjamin Jr., apparently uh, just never, uh, what's the saying, fails to launch. Uh, he, at the age of 15, his father is confiding in his diary that his son is uh, addicted to fine dressing and rowdyism, uh, that he uh, will sneak out of the house by crawling down the shutters to uh, chase the fire companies. Uh, and uh, he will have a, eventually as an adult, uh, apparently not a very successful career. In fact, uh, as far as I'm aware, he rather disappears from the historical record. No one uh, has recorded when he dies and where or where he's buried, which is uh, somewhat unusual. Uh, so like all parents, I think uh, French had issues uh, with his children in uh, you know, he wants them to turn out well, he does everything he can for them, but they are their own individuals, and he eventually sort of accepts that and, and lives with it. Uh, and speaking of living with it, uh, this is a view uh, of where the modern day Library of Congress sits uh, and where French's house was at 37 East Capitol Street. In the distance there is the Anacostia uh, River, which was then known as the Eastern Branch. Uh, and Abraham Lincoln, when he is a congressman for his one term in Congress uh, in the late 1840s, uh, Lincoln and French literally live around the corner from each other. Uh, Lincoln lives at the Sprig boarding house. Uh, French, of course, has his home right around the corner. Uh, now, French does not mention Lincoln uh, in his journaling of the 1840s, and that's not all that unusual. Uh, they probably knew each other, and could have at least, uh, you know, had a nodding acquaintanceship, uh, but they were of rival political factions. Lincoln was a Whig, uh, and the French was a Jacksonian Democrat. Uh, but uh, certainly as a man about Capitol Hill, uh, certainly they encountered each other, and probably uh, French ran into Lincoln at the Capitol Post Office, where he liked to hang out uh, and tell uh, endless stories. Uh, this view was taken from the dome of the Capitol. That's why you get such an excellent view. Uh, it was taken roughly about 1863 or slightly earlier. But uh, French first arrives in Washington in 1833 in December. His first time in the Capitol is on December the 21st, 1833. Uh, and already he's noting in his journal that uh, there are tensions between North and South. Uh, what might happen to the Federal Union, he is uh, fearful of uh, because of upsets already over the issue of slavery and nullification. Uh, and uh, French will be in and out of the Capitol until, at least as far as I can determine, uh, he's last in the Capitol building in June of 1870. So he has a long run of being in and out of the Capitol, and he will record many interesting vignettes of what's happening in the Capitol. For example, the Greenhouse statue uh, of Washington, uh, the very Romanesque uh, shirtless statue of Washington, which I now uh, believe is in the Smithsonian. Uh, 
was first unveiled in the rotunda. Uh, and uh, French also is unique in that he always seems to be in the right place at the right time. He's always on hand uh, when great events seem to be uh, transpiring. And he's there when they're trying to crane the statue onto its base uh, and records that uh, due to apparently an issue or a problem uh, that the statue, the derrick nearly breaks and the statue nearly uh, falls and possibly would have been uh, wrecked. Uh, the statue does finally land on its base, but um, not everyone loved it. It will get moved out to the east front of the capital, which French then walked past many, many a time uh, before it gets eventually um, uh, or maybe it's the, the West Front, I may be wrong in that, uh, and eventually it ends up uh, in the Smithsonian. Uh, but the, the jobs that French largely has in the capital is with uh, the House of Representatives. And he will note, uh, as his journal, uh, the vignette that I have, or the snippet that I have uh, up on the screen now, uh, he will talk about the beauty of the chamber. Uh, the painting uh, is from about uh, 1823, so about 10 years before French arrives. But uh, as you can see in the painting, it's exactly as French describes it with the uh, wonderful red canopy and drapery uh, that, were, uh, that were installed. And what I love about French is that he will talk about uh, not only the workings of Capitol Hill, but also the personalities. Uh, and uh, for example, he will talk about these late night sessions, the capital that the, the house would have uh, and how they would drag on and on. And frankly, he says they're useless uh, and the members would start drifting away or falling asleep on sofas and the sergeant at arms would be sent out to arrest them, uh, haul them back into the chamber where they then would have to make explanation uh, why they were absent and either be chastised or fined uh, for it. And as he notes that at 5 a.m. when these men are being dragged into the house that uh, they don't exactly look like the first gentleman uh, in the country. Uh, he also uh, is witness, of course, to congressmen then or now, or congress uh, people then as now, uh, behaving in, uh, shall we say, somewhat undignified manners. Uh, he notes, for example, that a representative uh, was escorting a number of ladies around the Capitol grounds in 1838 uh, and was picking flowers, which was a no-no. Uh, when he's uh, challenged at doing this by one of the Capitol policemen, uh, he basically says, do you know who I am? I am a member of Congress and I will do as I damn well please. Uh, and then not only starts picking flowers, starts ripping them up, uh, scattering them around and saying, well, you know, somebody can fix that. Uh, he also is on hand to witness numerous fights or near fights in the House chamber, uh, where you have members, of course, fueled by political differences and invective, uh, occasionally going for each other, not just with fists, but occasionally uh, with pistols. And uh, some of the phraseology that was so offensive at the time, you know, today wouldn't give us a thought, but uh, you calling someone tool of tools, uh, a rascal, a scoundrel, or the, the worst possible insult, calling someone a puppy. Uh, that uh, initiated a number of full-scale brawls where uh, he notes, for example, I think it's a representative from Ohio, a rather large imposing man who wades into one of these frays and uh, like fighting dogs, pulls them apart and sort of uh, hangs them both by the scruff of their coats uh, to pull them apart to separate uh, them to get them to stop uh, brawling uh, on the floor of the house, all of which was frankly not that uncommon. And French will also be uh, the witness to not one, but uh, I think it's total four presidential deaths. Uh, he will be on hand. Uh, Jane, did you have a, a question? Uh, we have uh, actually a couple questions coming in from, from our audience. Um, one person was inquiring about, you mentioned in 1833, he was speaking about the disunion that he, that he felt yeah. uh, in Washington. Uh, can you just, I mean, people are thinking, well, is that just, is he perceive, you know, perceiving the Civil War coming or what? 
Can you tell us a little bit more about what that? Oh, was certainly, that certainly. What 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 he's referring to there is uh, that already there were issues, especially in South Carolina, uh, over first it was the tariff. Uh, Southerners felt the the tariff was too high. Uh, it benefited only northern manufacturers. They didn't care for it, uh, and um, you have the theory of nullification being put forward by people like John C. Calhoun and others, uh, arguing that a state has the right to nullify a federal law uh, if they so choose, um, if they feel it injurious to their interests. A and the Civil War nearly came early because you have South Carolina, uh, at least initially alone, saying that we're going to challenge the authority of the federal government and the Constitution in this. And you have Andrew Jackson, Calhoun was Andrew Jackson's own vice president. Uh, you have Andrew Jackson saying, oh, no, you don't. That I will personally lead the federal army into South Carolina and start hanging traitors. And the first person I'm going to hang is John C. Calhoun. Um, Jackson always said that the, you know, the two things he regretted not doing in his political career when it was over was not hanging John C. Calhoun and not shooting Henry Clay. Uh, Jackson, of course, was a man of great passion, great fire, a uh, man who carried several bullets in him from duels that he had fought. So that, that's what French is talking about, that there, uh, the, the, there were already concerns in the 1830s about uh, whether or not the Union was going to hang together, uh, and there will be a series of political compromises which will uh, postpone the Civil War at least until uh, 1860. Uh, was there another follow-up? Yep. Um, and then there were a couple questions about the uh, East Capitol uh, House. Mm -hmm. That one was asking that it was 37 East Capitol, mm -hmm. but today, even the block on which the Library of Congress is is in the 100 block. Or it, which, you know, do you know? Understand why? Did they change the numbers? Uh, and when well, did First get Street fronts it, at least it did in, in uh, you know, the, the 19th century. They do change things around, though. Uh, the, the, it, Congress said it, they, they will buy up a, a whole block there. A number of streets will get kind of rearranged. So that, that's probably the best way I can explain it. When exactly that took place, uh, I don't know. I would assume it would be when they were building the, the new, then new Library of Congress in the 1890s. Okay, and that's when uh, 37 East Capitol was torn down? Uh, yes, uh, the, the whole block. In fact, I think it was two whole blocks uh, that, that uh, eventually went uh, where that, those, those houses stood. And um, I, I always enjoy French talking about his uh, living at, on East Capitol Street. Uh, for example, he will talk about his cow. Uh, you know, he kept a horse and a cow. Uh, and I think the cow was just left free to roam around town and, and graze because on several occasions he'll talk that, you know, well, our cow has disappeared. Uh, I think someone may have intercepted her on the way home and, you know, I, I really want her back. She's a great cow. Uh, and apparently they do find her on a, on a number of occasions. Uh, also, what I love um, is that uh, French on several occasions, I don't know if Washingtonians still do this, but uh, he will talk about, for example, in the 1840s, having his sleep interrupted by a dog and a cat barking and caterwauling in an alley somewhere. So like a good Washingtonian, he rolls out of bed and leans out his uh, window, probably in his nightshirt, and fires off several pistol shots uh, to try to get them to quiet down, which apparently has no effect. Uh, but he does that on several occasions. He will talk about firing his pistol uh, out, out the window. Uh, and including firing, he had a hen house and somebody was stealing chickens. Uh, so he will uh, fire at them and, and scare them off. And his house does get broken into and uh, someone steals a bunch of silver. Uh, so well, and and he also complains about the water. Uh, that he has, own, he has his own well dug uh, in the uh, 1840s and they hit water at 48 feet. Uh, later on, he will link up to uh, you know, the DC public water system and he will complain that the pressure is not great, that uh, he thinks that uh, uh, the, the Navy Yard basically is stealing water and uh, you can't take a bath after 7 a.m. because uh, the water pressure is uh, terrible. Um, 
So it's, I, I always uh, gush about uh, small details like that, that you know, are everyday things that, that uh, we still have to deal with today that, that he's uh, talking about. Now, he also talks a lot about dentistry. Uh, he does not have um, good luck uh, with dentists. Uh, he has to have a number of teeth pulled. Some of them break. They don't pull, are able to pull out all the roots. Um, he tries all sorts of things. It sounds, uh, the one thing I would not have liked to encounter in the 19th century is dentistry. <laughs> uh, because if you have a tooth that's going bad, the only solution is to yank it out, and that often does not go well. Well, these are fine stories. Now, let, let's try to get back to your presentation because it is excellent. Certainly. Uh, and uh, as, as you go into the presidents, you might just share which was, uh, which was French's favorite and, and return to, uh, we'll try to see as many, you know, as we can hold and sort of group the questions so that you can get through the presentation because people are absolutely excited to hear you talk. Splendid, splendid. Uh, well, uh, French, as I said, he will be on hand. Uh, he just, he, he's walking through the rotunda and hears that uh, John Quincy Adams, who returned to the House of Representatives after the presidency, has had a stroke and is basically dying in the speaker's room. Uh, off the House of Representatives, and he goes and sees him while he's still alive, and then the next day returns after he's dead, and uh, comments that, uh, as many, you know, death was everywhere in the 19th century, and he will comment on this quite frequently, uh, that the day before, you know, Adams was still alive, the, the brilliant intellect, uh, the almost godlike mind of John Quincy Adams now has been forever silenced, and he's a clod of the valley. Uh, he will be on hand uh, for when President Harrison dies after only a month in office. Uh, he doesn't talk about uh, Zachary Taylor's death, uh, until later, he talks about the, the procession, but um, he doesn't mention his journals. And then, of course, Lincoln uh, as well. Uh, so he, he will be on hand, um, and he will know all these presidents. Uh, really, from um, John Quincy Adams all the way to U.S. Grant, French will know them all. And it will turn out that his favorite will actually be Lincoln. He will say the nicest things uh, about Lincoln. Uh, not only while he's alive, but uh, also after he uh, is dead. Like everyone else, uh, uh, French has moods, and um, you know when Adams was alive, he occasionally uh, will lash out and call him various names in his journal, and then after he's dead, uh, or after things have calmed down, he will say glorious things about him. Uh, and the other president that he actually gets on rather well with and doesn't speak too badly of is and he's really one of the only people who does, and that's Andrew Johnson. Uh, as an old Jacksonian Democrat, they're sort of politically uh, aligned. Um, and interestingly enough, the president he probably is most disappointed in is a personal friend of 25 years, and that is Franklin Pierce. Uh, Franklin, he and Franklin Pierce were very, very good friends. In fact, uh, they wrestled uh, each other, and apparently Pierce was an excellent wrestler, um, and uh, Pierce will become president in the early 1850s and prove to be a tremendous disappointment uh, to basically everyone, uh, and to French in particular. Their friendship really suffers uh, not only because of French's political, or pardon me, not only because of uh, Pierce's political tact. Uh, Pierce is what's called a doe face. That is, he's a northern politician with very pro-southern, very pro-slavery views. Uh, French, uh, and, and French will be commissioner of public buildings under Pierce, uh, at least for several years before he gets sacked for uh, apparently dabbling in know nothing as them uh, in the mid-1850s. Uh, and so really, I think uh, uh, Pierce is, he doesn't necessarily dislike him, and he again says nice things about him when he dies, but uh, Pierce is probably the, the greatest disappointment. And as I said, French just has a knack for being at the right place at the right time. He's in New York City, for example, when the Prince of Wales uh, visits in 1860 and the streets are mobbed. Uh, and um, P uh, French will also, of course, not be shy about critiquing uh, various sights, sounds, people, etc. Uh, when 
there's a new House of when the Capitol is extended in the 1850s, and there's a new Senate and House of Representatives wing, uh, wings plural that are created. Uh, French isn't overly enthused about the new House of Representatives, and there's a, a photograph of it there taken in 1861. Uh, he thinks that the the skylight, the, the ceiling is perhaps, you know, it's beautiful, but it's a little overdone for his taste. Uh, and he refers to the speaker's rostrum uh, as uh, worthy of a theater or a lager beer saloon or maybe the, a steamboat cabin. Uh, that he thinks it's a little overdone, a little overblown for a uh, sober republic, uh, but um, other people apparently seem to have been uh, quite pleased with it. And speaking of Franklin Pierce, uh, there he is, uh, that uh, French will, will comment in his journals uh, about that, that Franklin Pierce had everything going for him politically, that he, he could have been a, a great president, uh, but he failed, that he will, he will literally say that he held all the cards in his hand uh, and he's played them like a fool and lost the game. In fact, Pierce uh, will be dumped uh, by the Democratic Party uh, and will not be put up for re-election uh, in 1856, uh, which is rather unusual. Usually a sitting president and incumbent president uh, has a, a clear path to renomination and perhaps re-election, uh, and everybody wants to see Franklin Pierce go uh, by the late 1850s, and that includes his good friend, uh, Franklin or uh, Benjamin Brown French. Um, Pierce does not have a happy, he has a rather like the Lincolns, he has a rather tragic family life. Uh, his only surviving child is killed in a railway accident uh, right before the inauguration. His wife is devastated by it and never really acts as White House hostess. Uh, and poor handsome Frank uh, had great political difficulties and basically dies of, um, I think, uh, alcoholism of uh, liver failure uh, in 1868. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned uh, or originally or earlier on, uh, that certainly French and Lincoln encountered each other when Lincoln was in Congress. Uh, they knew of each other, but they were not uh, intimates, uh, at least not yet. Uh, and uh, French is on hand when Lincoln as president-elect, and I should mention also uh, that French like uh, especially Northerners, but a number of Americans in the 1850s um, begin, inc they're increasingly uncomfortable uh, with the, the spread of slavery into the Western territories. And French will begin migrating from the Democratic Party into the Republican Party, the, the nascent Republican Party formed in uh, the mid 1850s. Uh, French will become a leading Washingtonian Republican. Uh, and he's on hand when Lincoln as president-elect visits the Capitol uh, to meet uh, the various uh, House members of the House and Senate. is very cordially uh, received. And then uh, the next day, uh, French will and a group of others will call on Lincoln at Willard's Hotel. Uh, and uh, French comes away having a very positive opinion of him, that he thinks he, as he says in his journal, uh, that he, he believes he will make a first-rate president. On some of these political uh, you know, prognostications, he's quite correct. On others, uh, not quite so. Uh, but he's always amazed uh, that uh, Lincoln is the most unpresidential of presidents, uh, that he records him on a number of occasions as he sees him around Washington, um, not wearing his sort of trademark stovepipe hat, uh, not if you encountered him in the street, you wouldn't know it was the president, uh, that he was extremely approachable uh, and uh, French, like a good Republican office seeker, is hoping that Lincoln will appoint him to office. Uh, and indeed, uh, Lincoln and French, when he does get office, will be overwhelmed by office seekers. Uh, and it's under Lincoln uh, that French will become Lincoln's second uh, commissioner of public buildings. The first one, Mr. Wood, didn't work out terribly well, and he's replaced in uh, September uh, of uh, 1861. Now, uh, also French views uh, Mr. Lincoln uh, at a flag raising uh, 
uh, in Washington uh, where somebody makes a mistake that there's this lovely flagpole with this American flag the president's going to raise with the new star of Kansas on it, uh, but someone's made a mistake uh, in that the tent that is put up around the flagpole where the ceremony is going to take place, the opening is too narrow for the flag to comfortably go through, uh, and Lincoln, rather than, uh, you know, wait for someone to try to climb to the top to cut the hole larger, uh, just uses his famous strength to uh, basically force the flag to go through. Uh, French was rather uh, disquieted to see that uh, it had torn some, uh, but when the wind took it and it gusted out, that um, the, the entire flag was still there. And he thought that that was an omen for the coming conflict between North and South, that uh, with Lincoln at the helm, that we may get through damaged, but we will get through in entirety. The Union will not be broken up, and in that, uh, he will eventually uh, be successful. Now, uh, French, as Commissioner of Public Buildings, is the one who pays the bills for, for example, White House refurbishment. Uh, and that puts him in contact with all the, the First Ladies, including Mary Lincoln. Uh, and French actually has a rather good opinion uh, of Mary Lincoln. Um, she could be, on occasion, uh, difficult uh, to sometimes work with. Uh, but French generally speaks rather highly of her. Uh, there are issues. Uh, Mary Lincoln, of course, wants to do well for her husband. Uh, wants to do well for the Union cause. She wants the White House to be, sort of like Jacqueline Kennedy many years a century later, wants to be the White House to be a showplace uh, for the Union. Uh, and she goes a little overboard in refurbishment. Uh, in fact, she exceeds the appropriated money by Congress that was for its refurbishment. And she then has to get French to go to the president to try to convince him uh, to okay those bills. Uh, Lincoln is very reluctant uh, to do so, and it's to French that Lincoln says that, uh, you know, I will not approve of these flub dubs for this damned old house, that it was furnished well enough when we moved in, better than any house we ever lived in before, I, I, I won't do it. Uh, and uh, what you see on the screen is actually not one of those bills from 1861-62, uh, but a bill from 1863, uh, and I blew up there. You can see Mary Lincoln has signed it, Mrs. Lincoln, uh, many people don't. She never referred to herself as Mary T. Lincoln. She was always Mary Lincoln, Mrs. Abraham Lincoln, Mrs. Lincoln. Uh, and B.B. French's signature uh, is at the bottom. And uh, it's fascinating the number of records that are left that are in the National Archives where you can look at all the original bills, uh, all the original bills for the White House for the refurbishment. Uh, that's how I sort of encountered B.B. French initially when I was doing research for the burning of the White House stable in 1864 uh, because French is responsible uh, for those bills. Uh, and one of French's duties as commissioner is to uh, announce visitors uh, at the official reception to present them to the president and the first lady uh, and that is what French will do. And again he remarks generally quite well on both on Mrs. Lincoln and uh, on Abraham Lincoln that they tend to be rather at ease uh, as hosts, uh, rather gracious. Uh, he does think Mary Lincoln uh, is a little imperious on occasion, but again, she is attempting to uh, support her husband uh, in that, uh, in, in how she, she's always perceived as very kind, very gracious, uh, etc. And of course, uh, the Lincolns will suffer sorrow in the White House when their, uh, one of their younger sons, uh, Willie, dies in February of 1862. Uh, French is the one that has to basically arrange uh, the funeral, and he is able to see the Lincolns uh, close up and personal uh, to see how grief is impacting them. Uh, both Mary and, uh, and Abraham Lincoln were, Willie was really their favorite child. He combined, I think, the best of both of them, uh, and his death of what we assume is typhoid fever uh, in February of 1862 was, was devastating. Mary Lincoln really never got over it, uh, and a French uh, witnessed that uh, and uh, took part in uh, arranging the funeral, as he will do for Abraham Lincoln when he is uh, murdered in 1865. Uh, and he does see the president many days during the week, up close and personal. He sees him around town, and he will talk about him uh, and as a, French really likes it. He, he likes Lincoln's humor. 
Um, he always feels uh, that Lincoln treats him very graciously, uh, even though they will occasionally clash uh, on a number of uh, political issues, largely to do with French's boss, uh, the Secretary of the Interior, um, who uh, French does not particularly care for. More on that on, uh, in just a minute or two. Uh, but French really is one of Lincoln's intimates during the war. He, he sees him uh, several times a week, uh, oftentimes several times a day, and uh, forms a rather high uh, opinion of his uh, capabilities and his gentle but firm leadership is the way French will summon it. Uh, also, I think um, in uh, one of the entries, I've been able to identify uh, this photograph is in the Library of Congress collection. Uh, most of the people in it are identified, but two of the individuals in back, and I think I've been able to at least solve one of those mysteries, because French announces it as himself in his journal. Uh, the green arrow indicates, as uh, French does in his journal, uh, that he's the one who's peeking o over the shoulder of Miss Kate Chase, who's the daughter of Salmon P. Chase, uh, Lincoln's Secretary of the Treasury. So uh, French is on hand when a group of Native American leaders come to the White House where Lincoln uh, will speak to them. And after that, they're taken to the White House Conservatory uh, and uh, they are then photographed. And French is one of those uh, who is photographed amongst them. Uh, and he also will see the president at times of great distress, great war weariness, uh, in which he will note that as well, that he goes to visit Lincoln on one occasion, and when Lincoln is writing out a note for him, he sees that uh, Lincoln's hand is trembling, uh, and that, um, as Lincoln himself admits, that uh, it, he leads a very hard life. There are lots of pressures on him uh, that are really endless, and uh, it's one of the reasons why Lincoln will attend the theater relatively often. It, it will be one of his rare incidents of relaxation uh, to go to the theater, uh, to unwind at least for a few hours and get away from uh, the various pressures uh, of office that are upon him. And French also is a man who likes to have a good time himself. Uh, he will be always talking about the various dinners he attends around town. Uh, he'll talk about the food, he'll talk about the, the flowing champagne, uh, and he will, this is one of my particular favorites, uh, he goes up uh, with a group of uh, congressmen and other government officials uh, up to Great Falls where they will board uh, a canal boat and they will basically uh, have a, a lovely uh, al fresco picnic on board this canal boat where lots of liquor apparently is served. Uh, and as he notes in his journal coming back, uh, apparently, even the boat operator uh, had taken part because the boat kept ramming into the, the bank. It could not keep the center of the channel uh, because, uh, apparently, of the imbibing that had uh, generally uh, gone on. So French always likes to have uh, a good time. In fact, if there was one word that I could use to describe French, I'd probably say he's ebullient. Uh, he's a very ebullient man. Uh, likes to have a good time, good conversation, etc. He enjoys that very much. Uh, French will also be on hand at Gettysburg when uh, Lincoln makes uh, his Gettysburg address, and he will visit Gettysburg on a number of occasions. And uh, being in the right spot at the right time, uh, French will be photographed. Uh, he puts in his journal that the day, uh, the day after. Uh, the ceremonies, he was riding over the battlefield and he happens to stop at what is Widow Lester's, Leicester's house uh, and he's walking around. He sees a photographer uh, who happens to be Alexander Gardner uh, who says, go stand on the, ha on, the, on the porch of the house and I'll take your photograph. Uh, and he does so. So there you see uh, French standing on the front porch of uh, Widow Leicester's house uh, at Gettysburg, which was uh, George Gordon Meade's headquarters. Uh, on day three of the battle, and it was heavily damaged during uh, the fighting on July the 3rd. Uh, and there's, there's French being photographed uh, there as well, and talking about the, the damages. In fact, uh, in, later in that journal, he talks about uh, people collecting uh, ammunition, shells, for example, on the battlefield. Uh, Ten minutes after he rides past, apparently a wagon and a, and a, a man and a young boy collecting some of these uh, uh, leftovers from the battle, uh, one of the shells goes off, uh, and I think the, the man involved is either killed or, or badly uh, injured. Uh, 
Uh, so uh, French is witness to many events, not all of them necessarily happy. Uh, and uh, French also, uh, of course, talks about wartime Washington, uh, about what he likes about it, uh, which isn't much, and what he doesn't like about it, which is uh, that it's crowded, it's dirty, uh, there are soldiers everywhere, and as he puts in his journal in 1864, many of them are often drunk. Uh, and that uh, he finds this distasteful that he longs for when Washington will once again be the capital uh, of just a, a republic at peace uh, and all the soldiers uh, can go home. Uh, French, um, I, I said he, he didn't get along with his boss, uh, the second secretary of the interior, John P. Usher. Uh, in fact, uh, French develops, he despises Usher. In fact, he will call him uh, jackass, puny Usher, among other terms. Uh, it's Usher that he has to report to. Uh, and he and Usher just do not uh, really get along, in part because Usher feels that French is exceeding his authority uh, as commissioner of public buildings and French responding that, no, I'm not. And here are the various laws passed by Congress uh, which give me the authority to, to do what I need to do. Uh, and Lincoln will stay out of that quarrel as, as much as he possibly can, but uh, Usher is really one of the men in the journal that gets the worst of French's tongue, uh, and Penn certainly. Uh, in fact, French isn't even officially invited to watch the crowning of the Capitol with the Statue of Freedom. Uh, and he notes that in his journal as well and says that since I wasn't officially invited as, as Usher should have done, I just stayed in my office uh, and didn't actually uh, attend uh, those ceremonies. Uh, but where they really get into a fight is over the rebuilding of the, the White House stable, which burned in 1864. Uh, here again, uh, French feels that he's acting according to law, according to his responsibilities as commissioner, uh, Usher is rapping his knuckles and saying that you've exceeded your authority, uh, you're going too far, etc. cetera. Uh, and they will get into a very heated uh, correspondence uh, over the uh, rebuilding of uh, the White House stable, which obviously doesn't exist uh, anymore. Um, and it's really sort of a, a, in microcosm, the rebuilding of that White House stable uh, is a sign of the difficulties between Usher uh, and French, how they really do not care for each other. Uh, and uh, Usher finally will depart the cabinet uh, in 1865, and um, James Harlan will take his place, who will end up being Robert Todd Lincoln's father-in-law. Uh, and French is not going to be overly impressed with him either, although I think he thinks he certainly was better than Usher. Uh, also, um, French uh, notes that when they are about to finish the Capitol, he finds some scraps uh, left over, and then he asks the foreman uh, whether or not perhaps uh, he could have some of those scraps and create a table from it. Uh, and he's, he, he's given these, uh, these scraps, uh, a, a broken panel and uh, one of the balstrad uh, and uh, a couple of uh, decorative pieces made of iron, uh, and they're fashioned into a table, which French then uh, brings home with him. And he says in his journal that I'm going to donate this at some point uh, to a historical society. And lo and behold, he does donate it to the Massachusetts Historical Society in Boston in the late 1860s. Uh, and interestingly enough, that table, uh, which you see, uh, is used at the second inaugural. Uh, and he notes that it, it held a glass of water for the president, which uh, I've circled there for you. That table can be seen today. It's, it's on loan uh, to the U.S. Capitol. It's in the visitor center. You can go and see the table uh, that French had built out of those scraps of iron and wood from building the Capitol Dome. Uh, and that, I think, is one of his lasting legacies within the Capitol. Uh, now, French, is he, he's in Washington when Lincoln is assassinated in April of 1865, by accident. Uh, that is, uh, French and a, a party of friends and others had gone to visit Richmond uh, after the end of the war, and they were even planning on sailing to Charleston. But 
Uh, for various reasons, that didn't work out. They were forced to return to Washington uh, on the late afternoon of uh, April the 14th. Uh, they had been traveling all day. They went to bed early. Uh, and the next morning, French awakens and is rather puzzled to see the street lights are still lit. Uh, and that there's a sentry po pacing a beat out in front of his house, and he, you know, yells out the window, what's going on, and is told the president's been, uh, been shot. Uh, he immediately, of course, dresses, goes to the Capitol building, orders it closed, and then goes on to the 10th Street house of uh, Mr. Peterson, where uh, Lincoln is, is dying. Uh, he stands by his bed bedside. Uh, he says a few words to Mary Lincoln uh, and Robert Todd Lincoln, uh, and then he uh, returns to the Capitol to prepare to put it in, into mourning, uh, which, which he does. And he's on hand. Uh, he's at the White House when Lincoln's body is brought back. And as he said, when it's taken out limp and warm uh, and placed upon the cooling rack. Uh, and, um, you know, he, he is present to see uh, the president's murdered body brought back and will return on a number of occasions to, to uh, view the corpse. Uh, here again, there, there's a French family connection, uh, and it's where his youngest, somewhat ne'er-do-well son Benjamin also plays a role that uh, French, Benjamin French Jr. helps build, helps design and build uh, the catafalque uh, that is put up in the Capitol building, and, and French's wife is the one who drapes it in black. Uh, that catafalque um, is the one that is still used. Uh, a number of presidents have lain in state on that catafalque, uh, and as French will note in his uh, a letter at that time, that he's, he specifically saves it uh, to be placed in the crypt below the rotunda that was initially designed for Washington's body, uh, and that catafalque is still the one made out, out of those seven-foot pine boards, is the one that French ordered built and that his son had uh, a very large hand uh, in uh, helping construct. So, in a sense, French, uh, at least one of his contributions to the capital is still there uh, and is still being used. In fact, it's uh, French's office that's going to have to be responsible for paying for uh, the Lincoln funeral. He does go see, he's one of the few people who will go see Mary Lincoln depart Washington in May of 1865. Uh, and he, he notes then that she's, of course, uh, undone by her husband's murder, uh, that he wishes her well, um, but, you know, there, there were definitely difficulties, uh, and that perhaps it's, it's a good thing that she may, may no longer be uh, the, the first lady. And as I said, French's office is going to be responsible for uh, paying for the Lincoln funeral. Again, all those records are in the National Archives, uh, and the total cost will come to $30,000, which in 19th century money, that's a, quite a, hef a hefty sum. Uh, but French is the one, uh, it's his office that is going to have to pay uh, for those uh, bills uh, in the end. And, and they're you know, a long time in coming in, uh, Lincoln's long dead before those final bills are uh, taken care of. Now, French, who had been reappointed as commissioner of public buildings by Lincoln, uh, will remain commissioner under his successor, Andrew Johnson. Uh, and again, uh, French had, generally speaks well of Johnson, although he doesn't necessarily approve of uh, Johnson's somewhat inept dealings with Reconstruction, dealing with an increasingly radicalized Republican Congress. But he feels generally that, that Johnson is a good person. Uh, he's, very, he's a patriotic uh, individual. In fact, when Johnson is impeached, uh, French refuses to sort of jump on the bandwagon of bashing Andy Johnson, which is uh, terribly easy to do, and there's a lot of justification for it. And according to French, uh, because he fails to do this, uh, the radical Republican-dominated House of Representatives decides in March of 1867 that they're going to abolish the Office of Commissioner of Public Buildings, which they do. So they basically legislate French out of a job. Uh, and hand the job, uh, the duties of the commissioner over to what becomes the office uh, of the architect uh, of the capital. And French, um, 
you know, so what, what's the saying that you should, I think, was in Hollywood that you should always be nice to people on the way up uh, because you're going to encounter the same people on the way down. Uh, French, after serving in a, a number of very important government positions, finds himself unemployed in 1868. He uh, really is forced into accepting a fourth-rate clerkship uh, in the office of the Department of the Treasury. And he, he doesn't want to do it. He feels humiliated in doing it, but it's necessary. As he says, it's necessary for, for me to live. Now, he has hopes when one of his wife's relatives becomes assistant secretary of the Treasury, a little later on, secretary of the Treasury under the Grant administration, that perhaps greater uh, uh, appointments will be in the offing, uh, but he's not going to live long enough to encounter that. That uh, political influence is going to force French to resign his clerkship in June of 1870, uh, and French is not going to live very much lo much longer after that. He will, for example, live long enough to see one of the, the many statues of Lincoln uh, that will be carved, including uh, that by uh, Vinnie Ream, uh, which is in the Capitol, and French actually thinks it's a rather good likeness of Lincoln. Uh, he believes that she really caught uh, both Lincoln's facial features and his general posture, uh, et cetera. And perhaps the, the most famous French-related statue uh, was sculpted by uh, BBF's uh, nephew, Daniel Chester French. Uh, he is the man responsible for the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, and he's the man under the, uh, or above the red X uh, in the photograph there. Uh, in fact, even as a 17-year-old, Benjamin uh, Brown French will note and say that, 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 that Dan is such a great sculptor, he is going to be one of the world's greatest sculptors, mark my words. And indeed, that will be uh, a very prescient remark to make because uh, Daniel Chester French will become one of the great sculptors, uh, both uh, in the U.S. and indeed of, of world renown. Uh, French, as I said, he's dismissed from his job uh, in the Treasury Department in June of 1870, uh, and he will die in August of that year. Uh, and his journal is, uh, there, there's no premonitions of death. Uh, he's really quite active, uh, tinkering, doing this, doing that. In fact, the last entry in his journal uh, is on August the 8th, uh, where he's making notes about the hot weather, etc., that his wife has come up and told him to stop writing, and so the last entry in his journal is, uh, Mrs. French has come up and says, I must not write anymore, I obey. Uh, and he then dies just uh, a few days later and is laid to rest uh, in the congressional burying grounds next to his first wife, and then of course later uh, his second wife uh, as well. So uh, he does also say, and I find this interesting, really from, it's always, interesting to get into the mindset of someone when they're keeping a diary, the thoughts that they will leave behind. Uh, and he will say uh, in 1866 that I've had a great life, that I've, I've had a, in a sense of fun life, I've, I've, life, I've lived it all, but I really, I wouldn't do it over again. In a sense, what, one, one lifetime is enough. Uh, and Ulysses S. Grant says basically the same thing, that, you know, I, I've had a good life, but to do it over again, I, I, I'd rather not. And that's, uh, where I, I will conclude. I'll be happy to take any questions. And let me thank everyone who's stuck through the presentation. Uh, historians and politicians can talk endlessly, so my apologies if I've gone on a little too long. But Jane, uh, are there questions for me? Thank you so much, David. This has been, you know, fascinating. And I've been trying to sort of watch the questions, knowing a little bit about what was coming up. And you answered several of them. One of the things that's always fun about this is that our audience sometimes has the answer to the questions. Um, earlier, there was a question about the George Washington statue being moved to the uh, East Front. Mm -hmm. um, and Barbara Wolanin, who was the former curator uh, for the architect of the Capitol, reports that, yes, it was moved by an act of Congress at the uh, responding to a petition from the artist who thought that there would also be a temple built over top of that statue, um, but that did not happen. Mm -hmm. um, we had several people asking questions about 
French's jobs, which you described he was the clerk of the house. And so there was, you know, two different times he was writing about the actual official activities of the house. Mm -hmm. And then this commissioner of public buildings, which you've just explained is a position that they then abolished in order to uh, put him out of a job and is now run by the architect of the Capitol. As you described it, the position of superintendent of public buildings was actually more than just about the buildings where you talked about he introduced the uh, guests in the White House. And so it was almost also a bit of a, you know, major uh, presenter of public events as well as public buildings. Can you describe a little bit about how that is different from what we now know as the architect of the Capitol? Uh, well, unfortunately, I, I can't speak about the, the modern day architect of the Capitol uh, and, and the duties and responsibilities uh, of that office. Uh, but uh, the commissioner of public building, it was, it was somewhat kind of a, of a grab bag of, uh, I, I, I have not looked at, perhaps there's official legislation that state uh, the required duties of the commissioner or if they just devolve upon it in the 19th century by uh, history or tradition. Uh, it does seem a little unusual and that's kind of why I used the title that I did, um, the major domo, uh, because he is responsible uh, for whatever reason, however it came about, for introducing visitors to official receptions, to introduce them to the, uh, the, the president and the first lady. French doesn't actually enjoy that terribly much. Uh, he will say uh, it's somewhat of a bore. <laughs> I don't really like it, but it does give me a chance to meet all these famous celebrities that I would never have intercourse with uh, otherwise. So you know that's kind of the the one fun uh, you know, task uh, of the job. But um, he's responsible, for example, uh, and here again I. I I've seen many letters in the National Archives, uh, you know, painting the fence uh, in front of the White House, uh, the plumbing, uh, shifting uh, the water supply uh, in the White House from a spring on Franklin Square over to what's called Potomac water, that is city water. Uh, he, he has all these different responsibilities, uh, lighting the Capitol. For example, when Congress orders the Capitol be, to be illuminated for some great event, French is the one that has to make that happen. Uh, and I'm always intrigued by these people in the 19th century that are in these positions, Montgomery Meigs, the quartermaster general is a, another one, who are just great at being able to triple multitask, to, to wear so many hats and, and do them all very, very well. Uh, and so, you know, French, he, he spent 40 years in Washington uh, by the time he's commissioner of public buildings the second time, you know, he knows everyone, he knows um, how the government works, uh, and he makes a very good, I think, commissioner of public buildings. Well, and we are coming to a close, but we have a couple of folks who have written in and were particularly passionate that you mentioned the fact that he was a prominent uh, Mason. Uh, and I did not mention that, but he was, yes. And, and that... Uh, they would like you to point that out in his role as uh, engagement with the Masonic Society. Uh, if you have a short comment on that, that would be great. Uh, well, other than he, he uh, French was very much a joiner. That is, he belonged to numerous organizations. He was on the boards of what, what was then called the uh, the Deaf and Dumb Asylum. Um, he he was very much engaged and he became a Mason and very much enjoyed it. He became a, a very prominent Mason. In fact, one of the, the, the leaders uh, of uh, the American Masonic movement, uh, he enjoyed it very much. He had a special uniform uh, that he wore. Uh, there's a lovely description, which I wasn't able to include the presentation. He gives a, a party at, at his home, a garden party, and uh, all the Masons are there in their full regalia with their plumed hats and that's, you know, moonlight, and it was apparently a lovely reception I wish I could have attended. Well, so, yeah, he, he, he very much loved the Masons. He was a very prominent Mason, uh, absolutely. 
And do you know if he happened to get to know Walt Whitman, who was working for the Interior Department at that time? I, I recall no mention of that. Uh, he, he does meet a number of other people, uh, Washington Irving, uh, for, uh, for example, a number of other authors and painters, et cetera. I, I don't recall him mentioning uh, Walt Whitman at all. It could be in the correspondence. Again, I just deal with uh, his published journal. But the, the French papers are voluminous. They are at the Library of, of Congress. Uh, and I encourage people uh, to, to go take a look at them. He, he's a fascinating individual. Uh, and I said, he's fun to, he's just fun to read because he talks about all these basic details, which we still encounter and have to deal with today. Well, thank you, David. And that's, that is why history is so much fun because it is the story of people, places and personalities. And, you know, we can look with, the eyes of history and say, of course, it was clear that the, you know, South would secede and that we would come back together and that we would build our union. But when you were living through that time and writing about it, nothing, nothing was quite as clear. Well, and I, I will add to that, uh, that French does say, uh, he, he will go back through his journals, which are some, I think, 11 volumes. And the one thing he'll complain about about himself is, and there are some pretty big gaps in the journals, that he didn't journalize enough. He, he feels it's a public responsibility for those engaged in public affairs that they should be keeping a journal and, again, recording what's happening. Because he even gets annoyed with himself that he goes to back to look up things and like, oh, I didn't write that down. Uh, or I, I didn't index this, I should have. Well, maybe that's a lesson for all of us that we should write down more of what's happening now because it will make a difference in the future. Absolutely. So we come to a close in today's presentation. Um, again, I want to thank you so much, each of you who has tuned into our presentation. We thank you for coming. We thank those of you who shared the invitation with your friends and neighbors. That is something that uh, you can do to support the society. We, of course, hope that you'll all become members uh, because as members of the Historical Society, you will find out about all of these programs as they're coming together. The other way that you can continue to support the society is by buying the mer commemorative merchandise that we have that commemorates the capital in terms of bookends and ornaments. We have a lovely uh, uh, brooch available here you can see on the model um, and if you tune in tomorrow I suspect you will be able to see one of the society's ties on Steve Livengood our chief uh, our, our, our chief uh, tour guide who has got more stories about the capital neighborhood than you can ever imagine so we thank you very much Dr. Gerlinman for your time your talent uh, we could listen another hour but we will not do that today. Perhaps there shall be another time. Thank I would enjoy that. My thanks to everyone who, who have tuned in as well. Thank you. And thank you to our listeners. Um, we will leave the questions open for a little bit if you have additional questions. And we'll try to find a way to get the answers to you to the extent that that's possible. Thank you. And thank you for all the kind comments that have come through the chat. Be well. Goodbye.